Cheers, Todd. Everyone go subscribe to Todd the Librarian if you haven't already. And tell him I sent you. Hi guys, Dane here. And today I will be doing my July reading wrap-up. So, I actually thought I hadn't had the best month. And then I started piling up the books that I've read. So I had... I had a very weird reading month where towards the beginning it was a lot of buddy reads and like longer books and then towards the end I've just been binging on um, my Penguin Mini Moderns. If I read as many Penguin Mini Moderns next month as I read this month I will finish and I'll have finished the whole box set of 50 and then I'll hopefully do some sort of wrap up video of it. But that's not what you're here for. You are here for the books. I'm just going to dive in. I don't want to make these videos too long. They're always like half an hour to begin with. So I'll j I'm just going to try and keep it short and sweet. Okay, so book number one was Clockwork Prince by Cassandra Clare. And this is book number two in The Infernal Devices, I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's about a love triangle between three people I didn't like. So, also again, my problem with the first book was that while it's meant to be set in Victorian London, you don't actually get m that much of that setting. It, it could just as easily be set with the other Shadowhunters books or whatever in New York in our modern time or whatever. It would only need some minor tweaks. And I feel like if you're going to go to the effort of setting something in Victorian London, you might as well build a real sense of it being Victorian London. Yeah, I didn't like this book. I am going to give it... I don't know what I gave it at the time, but I'm going to give it a 2 out of 5. I disliked it enough that I'm not going to read the third book and actually I'm just abandoning... We were doing, a bunch of us were doing a buddy read of all of the Cassandra Clare books in order uh, of publication. And I've got to this point, which is the sixth one that I've read now. And I'm just, I'm done, to be honest. I, I can't, I definitely don't want to read the third one in this, which makes me wonder why I should bother with the rest. So I do still have the last two Mortal Instruments books, but I'm probably just going to unhaul them and not bother. Even though they're part of a box set, I literally, I, I don't care enough to read those last two books to fill up my box set. The goal was to read Cassandra Clare and to see what the fuss was about. And, I mean, I guess I get why people like her stuff. It's just really not for me. Okay, then I read Kathy Acker, New York City in 1979. And what's cool about this is that there are also, like, photographs in it. So this is number 27 in the Penguin Mini Modern range. I will read you the blurb for each of these, actually, because they're not too long. So, a tale of art, sex, blood, junkies, and whores in New York's underground from cult literary icon Kathy Acker. And what I really liked about this is the fact that the pictures and the pho photographs inside it really just made it stand out from, you know, I've read 27 of them by this point. So it was nice to have something in a slightly different format. Oh, there we go. And I, I looked online and a lot of people were slating it and uh, I just thought it was fun. Yeah, four out of five. Okay, then we have uh, Dark Places by Gillian Flynn. And this is probably my favourite of Gillian Flynn's novels now, although my favourite of all of her books has been The Grown Up. This is basically about a, a woman called Libby Day, and when she was young, her parents were killed, and it's her brother gets arrested for it. And basically, she's been living off the insurance payouts or whatever up until this point, but she's now broke, and these people from this group who are like amateur detectives... They invite her to come and speak at this group and maybe sell some of her parents' things and stuff to them because they're all these like morbid collectors, you know. And she needs the money, so she goes along. And the only problem with this one, actually, that I had is that in, in the middle, with all of Gillian Flynn's books, they drag in the middle. At least they have done for me. And I think that's why I like The Grown Up so much because it was a novella. So that was my only fault with this one was that it did drag in the middle. I didn't guess what was going to happen in this one. So that's always good when you, you, you know, you're surprised. I think that's kind of the point with uh, the thrillers. And I actually, I, I mean, I find murders and true crime and stuff really interesting. So even though this wasn't true crime, the fact that it, it was fictitious true crime, if that makes sense. That's why I, I kind of enjoyed it. So I think I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give this a 4 out of 5. But I think in my actual review, I gave it 3.75. Also, for some reason, my review of Sharp Objects has started being viewed loads. It's my most viewed video in the last month. And I posted it like 9 months ago or something. <laughs> and everyone's disliking it because I didn't like it. Well, there was a weird bit in it anyway. It was weird. I'll link to... 
my reviews for Sharp Objects and Dark Places below, actually. And I'll also link to my review of this one, which is Interview with a Vampire by Anne Rice. Now, I've seen part of the film of it when I was like a little kid. My dad was watching it, and I don't think I was supposed to be watching it. I think I was like leaning around a door or something to watch it. That said, that was far enough back that I don't really remember any of it. What I really enjoyed about this was the way that it had Rice's take on like vampire lore and the legend of vampires. And so that's mainly what I focused on my in my review below, so I won't talk too much more about it. But yeah, it was pretty good. This is probably another 3.75 out of 5. I'm in no burning desire to read more Anne Rice, but I probably will do if I see one lying around somewhere. Alright, then we have Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill, which I really enjoyed this. I'll give you the rating now. This is a 4.5 out of 5 for me. It's basically about this unlikable aging rock star who's in his like 40s and 50s, and he collects all of this like weird stuff. So the reason that it's called Heart Shaped Box is he buys a heart shaped box that has the ghost of someone's dead uncle, I believe, inside. He already has a cannibal's cookbook, a witch's confession, and an authentic snuff movie. So it says here, as an aging death metal rock god, buying a poltergeist almost qualifies as a business expense. But then this this poltergeist turns out to be real and starts hunting him. And we see that like his whole backstory comes through throughout the throughout the novel. I just really enjoyed it. I thought the ghost in it was just terrifying, really. It's just very sinister, some of the things you can do. And it's kind of stuck with me, you know? Some of these have reviews that I haven't posted yet as well because of upload schedules and all that stuff. So I may post full reviews of some of these in the future. Then we have Brett Easton Ellis, American Psycho. This was one of the buddy reads. In fact, so was Anne Rice and Joe Hill. And uh, Dark Places, actually. These are all finishing off the buddy reads. And there will be a new buddy reads video coming out for people who want to do more of them with me. So American Psycho, it was okay. My main thing that I kept going with throughout it was I was tabbing out every time there was a mention of Donald Trump and it was just ridiculous. I think it was too unsubtle, you know, the whole sort of theme of the worship of money and linking people who worship money to people who have no scruples and no morals or whatever. And yeah, it just beat you around the head with it a bit too much. I watched the movie with Becker afterwards and I much preferred the movie, but the way I would describe it is the book was okay. And the movie was pretty good. Like, neither of them were mind-blowing for me. I will probably, looking back on this, I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5. But I did at least finish it, and a lot of the people I read it with just DNF'd it. So there's that. Okay, then I read Salvage by Duncan Ralston. This was for Tarden Danes. Indie read-along. Salvage is a ghost story by an indie writer. I actually know Duncan Ralston. We were, you both used to be published by Forsaken, which is the horror imprint of... Booktrope publications, alas, they're no longer in business now, but we, we have that connection anyway. And this is basically about this guy who, uh, it's all set in Canada, by the way, as well. And uh, it's about a guy who, he wants to find out the truth behind his sister's death. So his little sister basically drowned in this lake in this, in this town, so he goes back to the town to try and discover what he can. And of course, he ends up diving into the lake. And of course, there are ghosts and all kinds of weird stuff. Religion comes into it. It's all... Uh, it's all pretty good, actually, I must say, and it's his first novel as well, which may explain why, like, it's not my favourite of the books of his that I've read, but I did still enjoy it. I'll give it a, uh, I'll give it a 3.75 out of 5 here. Then we have Othello by William Shakespeare, so this is kind of a buddy read with Roy Eve Reads. Basically, she mentioned that she was going to read it, so I used that as an excuse to read it myself. This is a used copy that's full of someone's notes as well, which is very cool. Yeah, I enjoyed this one. I uh, It wasn't my favourite Shakespeare play, but I definitely would like to go and see it play uh, perform live. And I think as well, there's a lot of like irony in it and a lot of lines in there that can vary depending upon how they're delivered as to what their meaning is, if that makes sense. So I think it'd be interesting. Well, I suppose that's true of most Shakespeare plays, but I think it'd be interesting to see it perform live. I like Diego. I think at times he was a bit of a pantomime villain. Like he was... He was too, like, it was too over the top because everybody loved this guy, but we as the audience knew he was a villain. Someone's just walked past holding a dog, but holding it like this so its face is up, like, in front of them. <laughs> the one problem that I did have with it is when there's this scene where Desdemona drops this handkerchief and Othello is like, leave the handkerchief! And she's like, oh, okay. And this is a handkerchief that means a lot to both of them. And then later, when it's it's gone and it reappears somewhere else that's been done to frame someone, they're all like, oh, this must be true. And it's like, 
Dude, do you not remember the conversation you had where you told her to leave it on the floor? 3.5 out of 5, I think. Douglas Adams, The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. This is Dirk Gently, book number two. I'm not even going to attempt to summarise the plot because it's very difficult. I like this little foil thing on it as well. Uh, so Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency is Douglas Adams' other series other than The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And basically... It follows, like, everything is connected, basically, and Dirk gently investigates these things. But really, it's almost as though things happen to him rather than that he happens to them, you know. It's very re reminiscent of, like, Doctor Who, but quirkier almost, you know. What I liked about this one is that there were gods in it as well, and it was the uh, Viking gods, I believe, so Thor was knocking around. It says, funnier than Psycho, more chilling than Jeeves takes charge, shorter than War and Peace, the new Dirk Gently novel. And uh, I really enjoyed it. This was probably better than the first one for me. I think just with these books, the plot takes a backseat to the humour and the jokes in it. And the jokes in this were funnier, I think. So for that reason, I'm going to give it a... Ooh, I'm going to give it a... A 4.25 out of 5. These, these 0.25s aren't really working. Tell me if 0.25 annoys you and I won't use it. It's just to try and mark books apart from other books with similar ratings you know what i mean it's slightly better than a four okay up next we have to kill a mockingbird by harper lee this was a reread it was for catalyst reads rereadathon i listened to it via audio via an audio book that was made before i was born as well and for the first couple of discs of it actually it was it wasn't the best audio book you know so becca actually started listening to it with me and then just said you can finish it by yourself so I did, and I basically ended up binging the second half of it in one evening. I mean, it's a beautiful book. It's a classic, and everyone should read it. It's a 5 out of 5 for me. And, uh, yeah, this is probably about the 6th or 7th time that I've read it, and I'm even having, after having finished rereading it, I'm like, I want to reread it again at some point. Okay, this is where we then switch to some of the smaller books. I actually picked up The Passage by Justin Cronin. And I really have not been enjoying it. So that, that was another buddy read as well. The other two people I buddy read it with have now finished and didn't like it. I'm on page 700 or something. But I read about 500 pages and was just I switched it over for my bedtime book. And because I'd not enjoyed it so much, I decided to read some shorter books. So here we have The Library of Trinity College Dublin by Harry Corey Wright. Harry Corey Wright is a photographer. The Library of Trinity College Dublin is one of the most famous libraries in the world. And these are literally just a collection of photographs throughout the library. It also does have like an, introduct an introductory essay by somebody who works there. But really it's just a beautiful sort of coffee table book. It's also got quotes as well. So for example, Jonathan Swift, Books of the Children of the Brain. It's just beautiful really. I, I can't give this anything less than a 4 out of 5. Alright, then we get to a stack of these Penguin Mini Moderns. So here we have Chinua Achebe, Africa's Tarnished Name, the blurb here. Electrifying essays on the history, complexity and appropriation of a continent from the father of modern African literature. And I like these. These were like little essays. At, well, it says little es electrifying little essays, I suppose. But um, they were very approachable. Achebe wrote in such a way that he was very convincing and I think that's a good thing, you know. I, I actually would agree that it's a good idea to read some of his essays. And he includes here, uh, What is Nigeria to me? And in that essay, he talked about how Nigeria isn't like a mother or a fatherland. It's like a child that needs nurturing and it's, it's down to her people to help nurture her into an adult, which I thought was a good way of looking at it, especially for like a developing country and especially when, whenever that was written. Susan Sontag, Notes on Camp, the blurb here. These two classic essays were the first works of criticism to break down the boundaries between high and low culture and made Susan Sontag a literary sensation. Hated it. One out of five stars. I thought it was pretentious waffle. I'm going to skip in at random and read some of it to you. Detachment is the prerogative of an elite, and as the dandy is the 19th century surrogate for the aristocrat in matters of culture, so camp is the modern dandyism. Camp is the answer to the problem, how to be dandy in the age of mass culture. The dandy was overbred, his posture was disdain or else ennui. He sought rare sensations, undefiled by mass appreciation. He was dedicated to good taste. The connoisseur of camp has found more ingenious pleasures. Not in Latin poetry and rare wines and velvet jackets, but in the coarsest, commonest pleasures in the arts of the masses. Mere use does not defile the objects of his pleasure, since he learns to possess them in a rare way. Camp, dandyism in the age of mass culture, makes no distinction between the unique object and the mass-produced object. 
Camp taste transcends the nausea of the replica. Thank you for that bollock, Susan. We have John Berger, the red tender of Bologna, says, A dreamlike meditation on memory, food, paintings, a fond uncle, and the improbable beauty of Bologna from the visionary thinker and art critic. So this, for me, worked really well be as like an evocation. It made me feel as though I was in the place that he was writing about. We'll just leave that bit in. It'll be fine. And so... Yeah, it was like going on holiday to Bologna, basically. I really enjoyed it. And it was also almost in like a stream of consciousness way. It was almost like Mrs. Dalloway in the way that that's kind of structured, I think. But um, really enjoyed it. Very beautifully written. Four out of five. Okay, then we have Francois Sagan, the gigolo. A middle-aged woman breaks with her young lover. Her husband is suspected of infidelity. A dying man reflects on his extramarital affairs in these shimmering, bittersweet tales of desire and disillusionment. Didn't really enjoy this, it's about love and romance and sex, and which is not stuff I particularly enjoy reading about. There was also this really worrying bit, I'm sure I'm not going to find it. I, I found it for my reading vlog and it took me ages to actually find it. Here we go. She shut the door hastily as though she had witnessed a rape and, emptying the ashtrays, tidying away the bottles, chatting amiably, she set, down, she set about trying to distract Linda from her initial curiosity and get her to sit down. So... Personally, if I witnessed a rape, I would not just calmly close the door and go and clean out an ashtray. I'd try and stop it. So, that was really odd. That I, I didn't like that. That wasn't good. Left a dirty taste in my mouth. 2.5 out of 5, and that's being generous. And we have Rudolf's Blaumanis in the Shadow of Death. This is a classic Latvian short story. Uh, it's an 1899 short story masterpiece based on a contemporary newspaper account telling of several fishermen lost at sea. It actually wasn't as good as I was expecting it to be. It was okay, though. It was quite well written. The translation of it was good. It just... It was like um, The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, where I just... I didn't particularly like... Nothing happened, really. Like, I don't know. It just wasn't for me. I don't like reading about the sea. Stop writing books about the sea. And we have Cyprian Aquensi, A Glittering City. Untrustworthy, charming, fussy Joe spins tall tales and breaks heart in this rollicking story set in the sensational city of 1960s Lagos. Now what's cool about this is that Fussy Joe is like a blues musician and he actually feels like a real person and this is, out of all of the Penguin Mini Moderns, the one that's the most felt to me, like the complete history of, you know, one, one person. And it's pretty cool because of that. I will give this a uh, 3.75 out of 5. Okay, we have Jack Kerouac, Peers of the Homeless Night. Searing, freewheeling snapshots of life on the road across America from the beat writer who inspired a generation. So this is all excerpts from Lonesome Traveller, which I have already read. So this is almost a reread for me, except obviously it's my first time reading this. And yeah, I enjoyed it. I love Kerouac. So 4 out of 5. Uh, yeah, I actually think most of his stuff is better than On the Road and Lonesome Traveller is one of those. To be honest, I would just say buy Lonesome Traveller and read that. I appreciate I'm not going into massive detail on these, but I don't want this video to last forever. Hans Falada, why do you wear a cheap watch? Darkly funny, streetwise tales of low lives, grifters and ordinary people trying to make ends meet in pre-war Germany. And the title essay of this was actually the weakest part of it, I think. What else did we have in here? We had, oh, we also had War Monument or Urinal, which I really liked. This was like about, about like the, uh, what would you call it? Like the controversy in a small town when a newspaper man writes an article speculating what might be built to like stop people and make them spend more time in the town. And suddenly everyone has an opinion on it. And like the mayor is like, why did you do that? Because now we all have to have opinions on it, which means now we all have to educate ourselves about it. You could have just kept your mouth shut. So yeah, enjoyed this. I would say 3.75 out of 5. Pretty good. Then we have Truman Capote, the Duke in his domain. Sorry, I would pronounce that the Duke. I don't know why I said Duke. This mesmerizing profile of an insecure, vulnerable young Marlon Brando brooding in a Kyoto hotel during a break from filming is a peerless piece of journalism. Now, unfortunately for me, it is basically like a really long magazine article. And I don't know whether it belongs in the Penguin Mini Modern Classics, especially compared to some of the other stuff that Capote's written. It was alright. It's, it's made me want to read more Capote. I also have in Cold Blood knocking about somewhere, and I've read Breakfast at Tiffany's. But this, 3 out of 5, I, I, I was just bored by it. I'm not too interested in Marlon Brando either, so... 
But right, here we have Richard Dawkins, The Blind Watchmaker. This was my bedside book, which I, I swapped the, uh, the passage out for. And this is actually, this book is older than I am. There are bits about computer programs in there. Like the computer program was written in like a 1988 Apple Macintosh. And uh, still, it still holds up the, it's basically an update on evolution where it argues a lot of the criticism that people have levied at evolution just by using science and reason, to be honest. If you've read Dawkins before, you know what to expect. The, the core idea of the blind watchmaker is that people compare like a human eye to a watch being like, there's no, you can't have half an eye, it wouldn't work. It has to have been designed like a watchmaker making a watch. And Dawkins argues that evolution is a blind watchmaker. It makes a watch without knowing that's what it's making. 3.75 out of 5 for me. Here we have F. Scott Fitzgerald, Babylon Revisited. And this is one of the older Penguin mini modern classics because they did a run in like 2011. I found this at a car boot sale. It has Babylon Revisited, The Cut Glass Bowl and The Lost Decade. These are all out of a wider short story collection called Babylon Revisited. So I'm probably going to read that collection. I also just want to read some more Fitzgerald in general. I have read The Great Gatsby. I read that years ago. I actually got a copy of it free from work at the time. And I did enjoy that, but I'd forgotten how much I liked his writing style until I picked this up and really enjoyed it. So yeah, definitely want to read some more Fitzgerald. Then we have Catherine Ann Porter, The Cracked Looking Glass. This one says, A passionate, unfulfilled woman considers her life and her marriage in this moving novella by one of America's finest short story writers. Again, it was about marriage, so I... I don't even remember it, I'm sorry. And I haven't read that much since it. So that proves how much I enjoyed it. I guess I'll give it a three out of five because I don't remember it. I mean, it didn't offend me. I just was bored. Here we have Neil Gaiman and Chris Riddell, Fortunately The Milk. This is a children's book. I also got this from the car boot sale. Neil Gaiman's really hit and miss for me. Sometimes I love his stuff, sometimes I hate it. This fell on the love spectrum. It was just funny. It was funny and fun, and even though it's aimed at children, the sense of humour still worked for me as an adult. The illustrations were also very, very cool. And, uh, yeah, I would just recommend getting this. It, it only takes, like, what, an hour or something to read, and it's just fun. And also, I like the fact that the character even looks like Neil Gaiman. Okay, then we have James Baldwin, Dark Days. Drawing on Baldwin's own experiences of prejudice in an America violently divided by race, these soaring essays blend the intensely personal with the political to envisage a better world. And I thought it was okay. Uh, I'm disappointed because I've heard really good stuff about James Baldwin, and so I'm probably going to give him another try, because this was alright, but whether it's it didn't really stand out to me out of all the other books that I read this month, out of all the other Penguin Mini Moderns. And I was expecting this to be like when I read, say, uh, I don't know, Ralph Ellison or even Leonora Carrington when I, where I read them and it just blew my mind, you know, and it did not do that, unfortunately. I'll still give it a 3.5 out of 5. The Little Horse Bus by Graham Greene. So this is one of his delightful children's novels. I've been kind of getting one of these one a month just because I'm, I'm trying to read everything that Graham Greene's ever written. So I've also done a lot of his essays and stuff. This was actually probably the best of his children's books. I'll give it a 4 out of 5. It's about um, literally a horse bus, a bus pulled by horses, and how it uh, stops some thieves. Then we have Georges Simenon, uh, Letter to My Mother. I think I pronounced his name right, I don't know. Georges Simenon's stark confessional letter to his dead mother explores the complexity of parent-child relationships and the bitterness of things unsaid. And this is kind of, well as it sounds, it's a letter to his mother where he talks about all the stuff he never talked to her about when she was alive and because of that it's very moving and it made me as a reader I just wanted to reach out to everyone I love and let them know that I love them I think this is a solid four out of five and uh, it's just a very touching book and finally number 40 William Carlos Williams Death the Barber filled with bright unforgettable images the deceptively simple work of William Carlos Williams revolutionized American verse and made him one of the greatest 20th century poets now I've already read William Carlos Williams collected poems one and two which is everything that he ever wrote so I had already read all the poems in this but nevertheless I still enjoyed reading this I think it's a great little introduction if you've never read any William Carlos Williams before and I would encourage reading some William Carlos Williams especially if you're not that into poetry because I think he's just a very approachable poet I just really love his writing style and um, I think something like this you know it's a good way to, to know if you like him or not and if you do like him he's got so much more for you to discover I'm just gonna read this one poem this is just to say 
This is what I, uh, I studied this at university, by the way. I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox, and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious. So sweet and so cold. 4.5 out of 5 for this one, I think. So, it is that delightful time where I tell you my favourite and least favourite books of the month. And it shouldn't be too difficult, actually. My favourite book of the month was Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill. Definitely recommend it if you like horror and you're up for a ghost story. Really enjoyed it. And my least favourite book of the month, Susan Sontag, Notes on Camp. Let me read you some more gibberish. What is extravagant in an inconsistent or an unpassionate way is not camp. Neither can anything be camp that does not spring, seem to spring from an irrepressible, a virtually uncontrolled sensibility. Without passion, one gets pseudo-camp, what is merely decorative, safe, in a word, chic. On the barren edge of camp lie a number of attractive things. The sleek fantasies of Dali, the haute couture precision... The haute couture precision... The haute couture preciosity of Albicopco's The Girl with the Golden Eyes. But the two things, camp and preciosity, must not be confused. So yeah, that is it. That is it for this month's wrap-up. Now, as of filming, this is on about 32 minutes. I reckon I can maybe get it down to 25, which is actually probably like average length for my videos. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do long videos. I try not to do long videos. I mean, I could break up my wrap-ups and do like a mid-month one. But I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know. For me personally, it's more convenient to have it all in one. And for me as a viewer, I would want that as well. Anyway, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know if you've read any of these books in the comments. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.